Hey guys, welcome back to Maelstrom Gaming Studios. I'm Craig and today we're going over my tournament list review. This is my first tournament with the new 9th edition Tyranid Codex. Obviously, we couldn't do one last week because the book just came out on Saturday, but this Saturday, the tournament I'm going to, the GT, the Renegade Spring Up, I believe is what it's technically called, uh, they have decided we will allow the Tyranid Codex, no Crusher Stampede, and no Leviathan Supplement. Obviously, GW made that official today, uh, the time of recording this. So I'm just going to go through an overview of my army, what I plan to bring, a little bit of how I plan to use it, and... And we'll see, maybe this list will do really well, uh, maybe it won't. Um, but I'm gonna walk you through all of the ins and outs of this army, so if you wanna try it yourself, if you have these models, you can absolutely do that. Before we dive in, if you do wanna help support the channel, do like and subscribe to stay up to date on all of our content here at Maelstrom Gaming Studios. It really does help the channel grow. And if you wanna support just a little bit more, we have an Etsy shop and you can become a member here. Links are down below in the description if you wanna check those out. Now, with all that out of the way, let's dive into today's video. So we're just going to get right into it. I will give a rundown of the list. You'll see it on the screen. I will put it in the description below. So if you want to see a little more official style, I will slap that there. Uh, this, you guys are so far away. I'm looking at it at the camera. You guys are so far away. Uh, so let's just run through. This is, as I'm calling it, red bugs go fast. A little bit taken from the orcs there. Not even a fan of the orcs, but red bugs do go fast in this case. So we'll lead it off with my warlord. That is my neurothrope. He has the resonance barb and synaptic tendrils for his warlord trait. Clearly a staple among all, all things Tyranids right now. You could argue you could leave off the Resonance Barp. I just, for the way my army plays, I need as much security in my casting as possible. So he's got there his powers. Obviously, Synaptic Lure. All of my High Fleet knows that for being Kraken. He also knows Smite. Catalyst, Onslaught, and Paroxysm as his bonus power from the Resonance Barb. He has 100 points. Then we'll go into uh, third in command, the Tyranid Prime. He is rocking... Uh, direct Guidance as a paid for Warlord trait for one CP cost. He's got Adrenal Glands, Bone Swords, and a Venom Cannon. He's just going to be there really as a backline support if my opponent has some chaff that try and deep strike in or something like that. He can help clear him out as well as giving off two very important buffs to my army. Those are Direct Guidance and Alpha Warrior. Finally, the real heavy hitter in close combat to my Warlord section, is, or my HQ section, is the Flyrant. He is rocking the Reaper of Obliterax. I went back and forth a lot on this guy for a number of things. One, you'll see he doesn't have a Warlord trait. That is somewhere else. I really wanted to put one on him, but I just I couldn't justify it in this list. Maybe that'll come to backfire on me. Maybe it won't. Uh, so no Warlord trait. Reaper of Blood Axe. I also really wanted to take the Maw Claws of Thyrax. I'm a huge fan of that relic. I know the Reaper is pretty good. It's really good. And many would argue it's better than the Maw Claws. I just, I love generating those extra attacks and getting those free rerolls for such a CP hungry army as I am learning. At least this, this play out of it. He also has um, Adrenal Glands, Lash Whip Bone Sword. And his powers are also Catalyst and Onslaught. You might be wondering why double up on those. Very simple. Uh, I just want to make sure if my Hive Tyrant gets out of Synaptic Link range of my Neurothrope, I can still have the ability to cast those powers, whether it's on himself or another unit on the other side of the table. I, they're just very crucial, and I want to make sure they go off. Then we go to the troop section. Uh, a bit more straightforward here. We have 10 Hormigants. Uh, just simple chaff for taking objectives and trading. We have 10 gargoyles. Again, simple chaff. They have a little bit more utility as I can use stratagems to take them on and off the table and move them around as I need. So great for them. We have three units of warriors. We have one basic four-man squad. They've got all quad-sizing talons, I guess it is now. Quad-sizing talons and adrenal glands. 
Really, the whole reason I did that, to be honest, is that's the models I had. I just did not have time to give them all a pair of bone swords and death spitters. So we're gonna stick with them. It will help in certain matchups, especially if they're not against Marines, they will do some serious damage to Eldar and Harlequins and Tau in terms of chaff killing, or even, you know, these guys can even do significant damage to crisis suits if they get into combat with them. So for my Xenos, um, allies, enemies, I guess, for my Xenos people, uh, this squad will do fine and great. The other two squads are Adrenal Glens, Pair of Bone Swords, Death Spitters. One of them has a Venom Cannon, didn't have the points for it on the other squad, so he just still has a Death Spitter. But these guys are going to be the more heavy hitter, uh, move up to counter my opponent's charging once my first waves have gone in, or be the first wave, act as Synaptic Links too. Then into the elites, we have three Zonthropes, stable for many Tyrant armies. I really wanted to fit a fourth one in there. Just didn't have the points to scrape away anywhere that I thought was worth it. So three Zonthropes with Neuroparasite. We then have three Pyrovores. Really liking these guys. They're not as good against Space Marines anymore as when the first Codex first launched uh, because of their plus one to, or their ignore EP minus one. However, I still have faith that these guys will do significant damage. They're also just pretty durable and can hold an objective if needed themselves. Uh, finally, another pretty common staple right now is the Malice Scepter. He will be providing psychic shenanigans all day, uh, neuroparasite and psychic scream for his powers, just going all damage all day with him. So. He also has Smite and Lure, so if I need to use some utility, I can do that as well. Fast Attack. This is where the real anvil, the real singing piece to this army comes in. We have nine Ravners with Rending Claws and Death Spitters. This, I'll talk about them much, much more, but these guys are the, the real hammer, or anvil. The hammer to my army. Uh, everything really centers around what these guys can do. We also have in fast attack the Parasite of Mortrex. I want to make this guy usable. I have paid one CP to give him the Warlord trait Alien Cunning. So he now uh, has objective secured, counts as five models when determining uh, the objectives or claiming objectives. And he can most importantly fall back or advance and still do action. So for some of those secondaries, or maybe you have to raise an objective or plant a bomb. I shouldn't even say secondaries. For some of the, uh, the primary bonuses where you have to do some of those specific actions, this guy is going to be doing those all day long. He's got a 16-inch move. Uh, he can advance for even bigger distance and still do those actions. And he synapses easy to hide, so it'll allow me to keep my synaptic links throughout this fast army that much better. Rounding out the army, we do have a Tyranid Harpy with the Heavy Venom Cannons, and I've gone ahead and paid 10 points to give him Synaptic Enhancement. Two main reasons for this. One, he can give out Synapse Bubbles, he can continue the chain across the map with his speed, and more importantly, once a game, I can give him the Synaptic Imperative of the Zone Thropes to give him a 4-up invone save, so probably turn 2. If things are getting dicey, I'll probably put the invone save on everybody. He is the only one who will benefit from the 4-up. Everyone else will benefit from the 5-up. But again, some speed to keep up with the Ravners and give off invone saves uh, as needed. So now let's talk about why I chose High Fleet Kraken. I really wanted to play with the speed that Kraken can offer. If you saw my Tyranid Stratagem video, I did probably a week or two ago. Opportunistic Advance has to be in my top three of most favorite stratagems in the entire Codex. The insane speed that it can provide is just unparalleled in the tiered Codex right now. Plus you can stack it on so many things just to create speed. Uh, also on top of that, uh, I wanted to play Raveners. I, you guys are more veterans to the channel. I bought these Raveners back when they were, you know, bad even before um, the changes to retrieve Nachman data, change to, yeah, um, 
to retrieve Nachman data. Retrieve Octarius data is what it used to be. I bought them during that when Ravners had no purpose being in a competitive list, but I've always wanted to own Ravners in the 10 years of playing. Finally got them. They are insanely good right now. So I wanted to take advantage of them. Best high fleet to play Ravners in my opinion is Kraken. So that is why we're doing that. I think speed helps a lot with late game. If you are a player who knows how to play very cagey with your opponent and know when to trade, not just go all in, speed will help you out in the late game very much so. This army actually really benefits on going second, unlike many other armies. Uh, other things to go with Kraken, like I said, uh, the speed is a big one, but Armor of Contempt is now, you know, plus one save to all of our marine enemies, our sisters of battle, well, most marine sisters of battle, uh, Grey Knights too, specifically. Uh, Chaos Space Marines, though I don't envision them being in the tournament too much. All of those guys get the plus one save. That means all of our new and improved AP across our whole army, pretty much ignored by that. So what I've done to counter this is taking Kraken, their high fleet trait is you get an extra AP on the charge. So all of my Bone Swords are AP minus three, my Scything Talons are AP minus two, my Ravener Claws, you'll never use the Ravener Claws with the, this loadout, you'll use the Rending Claws, which bump them up to strength six, AP minus five on the charge. So even if you're slapping two up saves that don't have an invone save, they're only getting a six up save against it. And Ravner's put out so many attacks that they are gonna do very well at shredding the opponent when it comes down to it. So that's a big reason why, is that I just think it, it just excels, it, it stacks on to why I think it's veering in this direction. Yes, Leviathan is awesome, and you can play some insanely tanky lists in Leviathan, but I just love the Ravner, so we're sticking with it. Uh, the other part is I can give them plus one to charge, and that's most likely all game. Unless I go up against Custodes, I'll probably take the ignore modifiers to my charge roll, so I can basically counter their Tanglefoot grenade strat, which is oh so annoying. Other than Custodes, I will probably always take plus one to charge as my infinite adaptive trait. This will allow me to, with many buffs, so we have uh, the rerolling charges, from my high fleet power, we have plus one to charge from built in. And if we have shard lure and we have a lot of synaptic shooting, well, not a lot, but enough synaptic shooting that I can put shard lure on anything I need to pretty much. And that will allow me a 3d6 plus one, picking the two highest charge on, you know, the units that I choose, rerolling for free. On average for my Ravners, this gives them a 27 inch threat range on the turn. Oh, and the advance and charge from Onslaught. 27 inch or 29 inch threat range on average for them is just insanely nasty for what, uh, what they can do. The Warriors have a seven inch move. I can do the same thing, all the same combos. They can have a, ooh, what are we at? 15 plus the 24 inch threat range on the Warriors. The Hive Tyrant can have a 34 inch threat range on average. Again, speed across the army when I need it is key here. Uh, so again, more on the play style. The big bugs, red bugs go fast. We'll talk again about why Raveners. I think they are one of the most important units for the Tyranids right now when it comes to maximizing the core keyword. Core keyword unfortunately came to the Codex, I'm sad to see it, but we don't have a ton of really powerful things that the core keyword can benefit. It is large blocks of warriors, large blocks of gaunts, large blocks of raveners, and a single Carnifex. That's it. That's pretty much what the core keyword can benefit. But boosting one Carnifex, it's okay, fine, it, whatever, really, but, but one Carnifex isn't gonna swing your game by putting all the buffs on him. Big block of warriors, that's great. But what can be even better in melee is a big block of raveners. You can put the plus one to hit, real ones to hit, and real ones to wound. When these guys go up against standard infantry, they are hitting on twos, rerolling ones, 
wounding most likely on threes, re-rolling ones. They have five attacks apiece, and that is just in melee. They can also level an infantry squad potentially in the shooting phase, being their death spitters are three shots apiece. At strength five, they're all hitting on twos with the buffs, re-rolling ones, wounding on threes, re-rolling ones. They can delete a squad in range and then go in and probably kill two more in melee all on their own with those buffs. So it's really big on the Ravners. They are also, the Ravners, insanely durable. Having toughness five, a four up save, which is great, better than what it used to be. You can give them potentially an invone if you have the synaptic imperative. You can give them catalyst for five up feeling of pain. And for whatever reason, they have four wounds apiece, which is crazy durable, especially if your opponent brings damage three weapons, then you're really, it's really gonna mess with it. Damage two, fine, but then you have catalyst. Also, in melee, Ravners are minus one to hit, which is just that much crazier. Paroxys in your enemy, that enemy is minus one to hit and minus one to wound. Just wild what Ravners can do. So that's, again, I've always wanted Ravners to be good, and now I think they're, they're here. Uh, one thing I have to keep in mind in playing my test games is the Ravners will go off and do their thing. Got to keep them in synapse. Otherwise, I can't chain my buffs to them. They could become less effective, still effective, but less effective. So again, the Parasite, the Flyrant, the Warriors, the Harpy, their whole job, not their whole job, but a lot of their reason they're around is to keep those Ravners churning with the buffs. Uh, and then I do have some objective, some trading units. The Ravners are not the thing where I'm just gonna send them on the center objective and sit there. They're gonna be moving around, slicing up my opponent's objective scoring infantry, just, just like that. Uh, while the Warriors, the Hormagons, the Gargoyles, the Pyrovores, they are the ones who are trading on the, probably the middle objectives with the Hive Tyrant's help or some on some of the outer objectives. So again, I'm going to keep reiterating this because it is cracking. Uh, I have to focus on speed more, more than not. I, I cannot just throw, throw away the Ravners unless I see a prime opportunity where I could level all of my opponents like scoring infantry or something. Got to take it then or maybe my opponent's got their biggest damage dealers and I've got a clean shot to just wipe them out. Might take it then. Uh, some other things I will have to, I'd mentioned these already, but my key powers and strats, my psychic phase is crucial along with all my stratagems I'm using, and I will be using a lot of them. I have found that uh, they're very, this army is very CP intensive to make sure I keep up the speed, so I do not have opportunities to do many, if any, command point rerolls or any damage reroll. Um, damage buffs, anything else to really help out the warriors outside of maybe once, it's all going into the speed. So Onslaught and Semnatic Lure, big. Catalyst will also be big, but Opportunistic Advance, Shard Lure, Overrun, and Circle the Prey, everything to keep my army moving. If you're moving well enough, you shouldn't be able to get shot in return. Uh, and then finally, just some secondaries to consider when playing this army. It is not as clear cut as some of the armies I normally like to play, but we do have a lot of options. So first off, the psychic options, warp ritual and psychic interrogation. I will probably take warp ritual every time the, there is an objective within six inches of the center of the board because my opponent is gonna be going back and forth on that. I and my opponent are gonna be going back and forth on that objective. It's going to be very easy. The plan, at least, is to put the Hive Tyrant behind a building safe within threat range of the center of the board. He and his, maybe my opponent, sits on the objective, whatever. Then the Hive Tyrant comes in, slice, casts the Warp Ritual, charges whatever is on the objective, kills it, and then uses Overrun to bounce back behind the building. And then he can hopefully keep doing that turn after turn. That's the thought there. Psychic interrogation, if I can't do it, if there's no center objective or I don't think it's gonna be viable to do it, then I'll just do psychic interrogation. If they have enough characters that I think are gonna be going towards the middle, 
it could be an easy, you know, three, four, or nine or 12 victory points throughout the game. I will have the Malice Scepter uh, Imperative, so allow me at least one turn to cast a power, or cast my powers and do a interrogation. Otherwise, it'll just be uh, probably the Hive Tyrant who's gonna be doing all the interrogating or the ritualing, ritualing, yeah. And then my other options, uh, for battlefield, battlefield Supremacy, again, if the center objective is in, or the middle of the board has an objective, probably be taking Stranglehold because I'm be putting a lot of forces into controlling that with the Hive Tyrant. Uh, probably my Gaunts and my Warriors are all fighting for that and the Pyrovores. If it's not, and we're playing maybe a six objective game, then I will look at taking Engage in All Fronts because again, I have the speed. It'll be pretty easy for me to have something in three quadrants every turn, so that's 10 points, or if I can put it up to four quadrants in a couple of those turns. So it's a good, that's an easy 10 to 15 points every game there. Now for my final pick, uh, it's a little tricky. I do have a lot of things I can do and it kind of depends on also what the primary is. So grind them down is my default. I've done it before and I typically get three to four turns of that one unless it's a game which I've already gotten curb stomped in, then obviously I'm not going to do that. But in a close game, typically three to four times I can do that. Uh, raise the Banners, I have a lot of infantry that can all do actions. The Pyrovores can do it. Uh, Venomthropes don't want to because if you do that, you turn off their aura. Uh, but the Pyrovores, Warriors, Gargoyles, Hormagons, even the Ravners could, and the Parasite most importantly, can be dropping banners all over the board if I need to. Uh, we can then try Retrieve Nakaman data. Again, an interesting one. Uh, normally not taking much for the Tyranids, but it is pretty easy for my army to do. Turn one, I can do it in a edge quadrant with either, with well, actually I say with probably the Hormagons or the Gargoyles. Turn two, I will do it in another quadrant with, again, Hormagons or the Gargoyles. Turn three, I can do it with maybe the Pyrovores, Warriors, uh, maybe the Venomthropes or somebody in my back quadrant. And then turn four or five, the Gargoyles can, with Encircle the Prey, just do it in the quadrant in the back corner of my opponent. Or at that point, maybe even the Ravners can do it. So. I have the ability to do Nachman data relatively easily. Uh, it is 12 points for four actions, so I might do that. We'll see kind of what my opponent has in terms of ignore line of sight, chaff killing, things like that. Finally, one I'm so tempted to try, but I know my opponent can outplay me with it, is the Cranial Feasting out of the Tier new Tiernid book. Originally I looked at him like, eh, kind of bad. Though, against certain armies, I'm thinking Marines specifically, Cranial Feasting has an option to be very good, as in you can regen potentially, potentially, 5 CP a game with it. It's not likely, you're most likely to get 2, maybe 3 back, but you know, you can at least get 1 CP back. And if you do that, it's 3 victory points. Uh, if you're killing, a lot of Space Marine players play min squads, like a lot of five-man squads of, you know, Intercessors, Vanguard Vets, Terminators, Blade Guard. Every time you kill one of their sergeants, that is a point. It has to be in melee, so your opponent could say, all right, I'll just, if, you know, if they die in a shooting, I'll pull the uh, sergeant off, but now that hurts their leadership a little bit. Uh, and then if you kill the Warlord, you get extra points. If you kill characters, all in melee which this army is primarily doing, extra points. So it's one I might try maybe against certain marine armies that are, you know, I don't know. Ones where I know I can tag them in melee and don't have to play too much at range. So that's pretty much it. Don't need to ramble too much farther along. If you got questions, ask them in the comments down below. That is my tiered army. What do you guys think? It is probably not exactly what you've seen so far as standard lists where people are bringing two flying hive tyrants or flying hive tyrant and swarm order or flying hive tyrant and the battleship venom cannon guy um very different 
I just, I think Crack and Ravners are up there in terms of one of the best units in 40k right now. Obviously it's easy to say that because the Tyrant book is the new biggest best thing, but when I make a tier ranking, Ravners specifically in Kraken I think are going up into A if not S tier. So that's all I got. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment. Do you think this list is good? Do you think it it's hot garbage? What are your opinions? I'll say I've played one game against it against a very very good opponent i don't know miles if you're watching we had an awesome game playing he is uh he's ranked number one in the u.s as gray knight player according to i believe it's what itc ranks their players like that he's a very good player uh, so happy i got a good game against him uh, did very well won that one wanted to get a few more games in against some other armies i think that are going to be potent like thousand suns but not yet so we'll save for a tournament Thank you guys for watching, and we'll come back to you next time here at Maelstrom Gaming Studios.